Welcome to the Total Wealth Academy radio show. Listen and learn what the wealthiest Americans are doing with their money and time that's different from the middle class. Learn the roadmap to financial and personal success that includes family, fitness, romance, charity, and all the parts of a balanced life. Now, here's your host, real estate investor and wealth coach, Trevor Davis. Happy Wednesday, everybody. This is Trevor Davis up here at Total Wealth Academy. We are now at the final countdown to our expo, which is on Saturday. So first and foremost, I want to extend that invitation again, as I've been doing over these previous shows in the previous weeks, inviting you out to the expo, which is officially this Saturday. So three days from now, Saturday, October 5th, it starts right at 8 a.m. sharp. If you want to sign up, you can go to TotalWealthAcademy.com forward slash expo. If you're a member, head into the member portal, go to the calendar, select the event, and sign up. Both options are going to allow you to select your food option, sponsored by Teriyaki Madness. Well, we're sponsoring it. We're paying for it, but it is provided by Teriyaki Madness, I should say. And pick your option between the steak, chicken, or the tofu. We will have tacos as well, just in case you're not interested in a teriyaki rice bowl. So that's covered too. So 8 to 12 is the educational portion. And then from 12 to 3, we've got the networking portion on the top of our parking garage where we've got the food, the free drinks, and all the networking and meeting with the vendors and all the fun stuff. And that's a very flexible section. You know, some people are going to get up there at 12 and then stay for just 30 minutes. And they're, they're going to leave. They're just like, hey, I just wanted the education and then the food, and then I'm gone. And then some people will be hanging out for, you know, good, like, two hours. Typically, we start wrapping up around 2.30 normally. And then we're typically closing the doors out there around 3. So the second section is pretty flexible. In the morning, um, doors do close after 8. So you do have to be here at 8 or before 8 in order to get in. So make sure you are on time for Saturday. And as always with the show, we're starting off with a quote by Einstein, which is the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. Is just coming out to this event on Saturday, for example, a change for your situation versus maybe just hanging around at home, you know, just doing the chores at home and dragging out the chores and then saying at the end of the day, hey, I did a bunch of chores but really, in between all the chores, which you could have done in two hours, you made it four hours because you were looking at your phone in between, you were watching some shows in between, and you were just kind of saying, oh, I'm going to veg out at home today. Well, this is an opportunity for you to meet some new people. You never know who you're going to meet unless you get up off the couch and get outside and go back outside like people are supposed to be doing. We're not meant to just hang out at home have everything delivered to our front door, have all the world's knowledge just accessible in the palm of our hand. I'm not saying that these things are necessarily bad things in and of themselves, but when we rely on them too much, we start to lose those connections. We start to see why, you know, like they just mentioned in the highlights with the vice presidential debate, why we have a mental health issue in this country, which I think needs to be alleviated first and foremost by making sure we've got more healthy interactions face-to-face. And that is literally in-person, person-to-person, face-to-face, friendly interactions, not texting, not over the phone, not on social media, not on FaceTime, but regular, old-fashioned, person-to-person interaction in real life. That's something that you can, of course, experience at the event on Saturday, amongst all of the other benefits. So I feel like that's the first thing that comes to mind when I think about change in the context of coming out to that. Again, realize that you're not going to meet anyone new unless you go out and take this quote unquote risk of coming to an event like this that might be pushing you out of your comfort zone just a little bit. Of course, as always, in the context of our show, focusing on investing in real estate and all of the other parts of a balanced life, I want to continue reviewing and expanding on the content from the UPW with Tony Robbins and the context of and combining that with the seven habits of highly affected people to continue staying on point and on focus with how we can arrange 
our daily activities to better effect instead of whatever effect that we've gotten so far. In other words, it's a very, very boiled down and simplified but accurate assessment to say that where we're at in our lives now, no matter who we are, is a result of what we've done. In other words, there are certain places that everybody starts and different places where everybody starts, but there are people that squander their opportunities and there are people that completely expand on the opportunities that they have as they go through their daily lives. And the actions that we've taken have created a certain set of results that we either are completely happy with or we can see some room for change. And this is that tipping point that I think Einstein is really looking at to say, if something is going on here that's not working for you, well, maybe let's take a step back and say, why is it not working for you? You know, let's take a step back and not even approach the change aspect yet. When you're looking at something that's causing an issue, why is that an issue for you? What exactly is the conflict? Talking about health, the first thing that comes to mind with that is if someone is out of shape, like most Americans are, and as I've repeatedly harked on, there, there are a ton of issues with physical health here in this country. You know, just brushed on mental health, but let's talk about physical health. When less than now a quarter of people in this country, less than one out of four people are even in a healthy weight range. And the correct statistics already identify that people that are more extreme bodybuilders and extreme athletes, they're included in that less than a quarter. So technically, when a bodybuilder has a, a body mass index that's higher and would be technically considered obese, these studies account for that and correctly mark them down as within an actual healthy weight range. Now, people are going to say, you know, I don't want to be out of shape. Okay, but why? What actually is the problem as you see it with being, quote, out of shape? What exactly is creating a problem here? In other words, where is the actual issue for you personally? Because there, there are some indications that being, you know, just a little out of shape you know, isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, as long as you're continuing to exercise, you can you can put on a little bit of fat and be perfectly fine. That's okay. So we're not saying that, or at least I'm not saying that someone has to be completely quote unquote perfect. But when someone is going to say, hey, I want to get in better shape, why is someone thinking that? And when we start to look at why we're having an issue with our current situation, that's where we can start to delve into the real motivations that are going to kickstart us into creating a tangible action plan to identify what we actually want to achieve and therefore how we're supposed to change. So folks, we're going to continue expanding on the specifics of change and where we get the why with change once we get back from the break. I'm your host, Trevor Davis at TWA. We'll be right back. Y'all stay tuned. If you have money in an IRA, 401k, or other retirement account, you can use it to invest passively in real estate without tax or penalty. Our average rate of return is three times that of the stock market and mutual funds with much less volatility. If you have over $70,000, you can start passive investing today. Please attend our free sample class to learn more. Go to TotalWealthAcademy.com. That's TotalWealthAcademy.com for reservations. Thank you. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Trevor Davis, lead wealth coach up here at TWA. As always, with the last show before the expo and with all of the other ones that I've been doing in recent weeks, 
I'm inviting you again to the expo on Saturday. If you're a guest, head to TotalWealthAcademy.com forward slash expo, E-X-P-O. If you are a member, head to the portal, log in, go to the calendar, and select the event on the 5th. And really the, the inspiration for today's discussion is from what we've prepared to discuss during the expo. And I'm not trying to spoil all of this. We're looking at the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic information. And I think the challenge and the issue here is that we're only ever motivated by intrinsic motivators. That's that's the reality because when we're looking at something that's extrinsic, you know, we're only doing that because there's some direct connection to a deep, primal type of intrinsic within you motivation in some way. I think the one of the biggest issues is that we misinterpret the motivations and we start to focus on the motivations that we're dealing with that seem to be external and we start to mark them as external and that makes us lose track of what's actually internally motivating us. Let's take, for example, with the fitness again, to continue that discussion on fitness. When someone says, I want to look good to other people so they consider me attractive, that is basically an external motivation. I mean, and I say basically because we're really working with some serious internal motivators there that we're going to get to in a second, but ostensibly, this is an external set of motivations. You know, you want to get a certain level of approval from other people around you after achieving a certain level of physical appearance through improved diet and exercise. And the problem seems to be that most people aren't really motivated by the external, quote, motivators. And even the folks that think that that's going to be motivating them, I really think that they're just completely losing the translation there and losing connection with what's actually going on to motivate you yourself. In other words, these actions that you're going to take are coming from within you. You've got some of that input and typically a lot of input coming from outside sources. However, it's up to you on how you respond to those outside, that outside information that you're bombarded with on a daily basis. In other words, have you not been able to completely ignore certain things and certain people in your life? Everyone definitely has. And then what about folks or situations or things that you hear that you feel like you cannot ignore? That you hear something happening, you tune into it immediately, you jump in on the conversation, or there's just a couple of people that just drive you up the wall on a regular basis, and you can't seem to ignore them no matter how hard you try. So we've got a lot of different stimuli reaching our brains on a daily basis. But one of the most interest, interesting things to me that science has shown, and I was thinking about this today, is that our brains are like the ultimate filter system. I mean, forget about the digestive system that's filtering out you know, all the stuff that you don't need, so on and so forth in your body. You know, your lungs are filtering out the stuff that you don't need and then exhaling the stuff that gets produced from your respiration all the time. Our brains are bombarded with light, sound, you know, sen physical sensations, internal sensations. But where exactly are you focusing your conscious mind? 
because I highly doubt most of us are consciously spending 99% of our time on a daily basis focusing on our heartbeat or our breathing. It's not the way our brains work. Something within us is causing us, if you will, to focus on certain things over others. There's got to be a lot of survival brain instinct to that for sure. In other words, if you're running through the forest and trying to get food and your brain cannot seem to identify and focus on a predator that's stalking you down, you're probably going to get eaten. So you've got to be able to focus on the things that are going to be dangerous to you and probably filter out a whole bunch of stuff that's not that dangerous. On the flip side, in a very civilized, spoiled society like the first world, like we live in in this country, you know, that bias makes us see danger and unpleasantness and negativity where there's really not a whole lot of that at all. So we get a very skewed perception. And then we start to think, hey, there's all this negativity going on, especially with folks that obsess over the news and obsess about some of the crazy stuff that's happening in the world right now. And then they start to think, that everything must be crazy, everything must be going wrong, they can no longer see what's good and what's working out, including for themselves. So we have to be very, very cautious with, even though we're focusing on the internal motivators, the external motivators are going to start pulling us and gravitating us towards different directions. However, no matter what's going on externally, those motivators are never going to be as strong as what's actually motivating you truly. So let's take a look again at the fitness and say, instead of wanting to look a certain way to other people and having yourself recognized in a certain way, what is something that will actually motivate you for yourself on your own? In other words, what if you were the, like, let's say, what if you're the only person on the planet? How could you have a fitness goal that had to do anything with other people? I mean, it's going to be pretty hard to have any sort of external goals at that point. But it seems that the folks that are focusing on the internal motivations are finding motivation on a more consistent basis. Because surprise, surprise... You're always with yourself, and you're always with your own brain. You're not necessarily with the external motivators and those other people positive for you or negative for you. But you're always going to be with your own brain. So when you've got this different mindset here of focusing on the internal motivators that are basically within you and without others you're probably going to start finding out that the goals that you can set with this focus make a whole lot more sense and are actually more tangible, more attainable, and easier to achieve. With something like fitness that would be intrinsic, I would say being at a certain BMI that you measure on your, for yourself, being at a certain blood pressure that you can measure for yourself. You know, more objective things, but also one of the biggest things that motivates me to stay active and stay eating well is just to feel good in general. In other words, that's my own personal feeling. That's my own personal sense of what I've been doing with my fitness and my nutrition and how that makes my body feel on a regular basis. And that thus far has been the biggest motivator for me to stay consistent at the gym on a weekly basis and eat healthy on a weekly basis. And maybe that needs to get a little bit more specific for most people. In other words, oh, you just want to feel good. Well, of course, everybody wants to feel good. Also put down some objective goals that are measurable. 
detach those goals from some of these external motivations and the street cred, the respect from others, you know, let that come later. Instead, set yourself up to where you've got a complete goal system for the specific avenue that you're approaching with us talking about fitness during this conversation right now, let's say it's financial. A lot of people get hamstrung financially because they want to look good to other people and they make ego-based purchases like a super fancy car, or super fancy house that they can barely afford. But instead, what if they simply said, I want to have X amount of rental houses with X amount of income a month. You know, of course, this is stuff that you can say and show to other people, but it's a lot less egotistical and it's a lot more objective. And there seems to be a very heavy connection with as it gets more objective, it starts to get more internally motivation based because the opinions of other people are not really objective. They're highly subjective. The external quote unquote motivators, which are typically coming from what you want other people to say about you, are ego based and just end up distracting you and pushing you down the wrong path. So we've got to take a look instead at a more objective goal setting pathway that's focusing on what actually are you specifically looking for on your own, by yourself, in and of yourself. Those are going to be the goals that you need to focus on and write down and create an actual pathway towards achieving. These are much better goals and much stronger and much easier to achieve. So folks, we're at the halfway point. We will be right back after the break. I'm your host, Trevor Davis, up here at Total Wealth Academy. Stay tuned. The stock market was never designed to build wealth. It was designed to keep up with inflation. The average rate of return over the last 75 years is about 7%. You'll get that even with the ups and downs. If you want a higher rate of return and less volatility, consider real estate. We make about three times as much as the stock market. Please attend our free sample class to learn more. Go to TotalWealthAcademy.com. That is TotalWealthAcademy.com for reservations. Thank you. All right, everybody, we are back to the TWA Wednesday radio show. I'm your host, Trevor Davis, lead wealth coach up here at TWA. As we start this next section, again, the invite for the expo is being sent out directly to you right now. Go to TotalWealthAcademy.com forward slash expo to sign up for our expo on Saturday if you are a guest. And if you are a member, go into the member portal. Sign up for the event by clicking the calendar and we will get you food, get everything all set up for you, and you will be all good for Saturday. Woo-hoo! Pretty sweet. So, folks, again, TotalWealthAcademy.com forward slash expo. And then we've also got, if you're a member, go into the member portal, go into the calendar, sign up, and both will allow you to select your food for Saturday. If you have any questions, you can also give us a call at the office. It's 855-576-7325. Again, our office number is 855-576-7325. As always, at the halfway point, we're going to do our year-to-date stock update. Nothing particularly crazy going on. Um, Just some pretty marginal shifts um, downward. I mean, we're still at the second highest rates for most of these. um, Two out of these indices still, so... Dow Jones year-to-date is 11.85%, S&P 500 is at 20.94%, and NASDAQ is at 17.52%. You know, we are just dealing with a lot of very interesting economic conditions because I, I took a look at an article that's saying that, as always, with all of this, all of the economic conditions that have been happening over the last four years since really the COVID response settled down after the immediate fallout. I mean, it's just news article after news article saying, oh, the economy's great. It's it's fantastic out there. The GDP growth is perfectly fine. You know, the economy is healthy. The signs are good. We're in a good spot. So on and so forth. But then it's just the economic reality is shifting for 
regular Americans. Because the 3% GDP growth doesn't mean that you've gotten a 3% raise, now does it? Not necessarily. I mean, all of these economic conditions going on are all pointing to the same economic situation we were at in many, many, many ways as 2007 before the 2008 crash. So my biggest one, my, the one that concerns me the most is that household income is dropping in the United States. We have lost on a median household income over $4,000 since 2020. So basically since COVID began, it's been steadily declining. And when you look at this information on the Federal Reserve website, it shows you where the recessions are, the actual major recessions. And by the way, the tiniest quote unquote recession was the one that happened in 2020 with COVID. And that was considered a recession because we did experience negative GDP growth. But that was for like a month and a half at most. And then the stock market exploded and we've had the biggest stock market gains in American history. So much so that if you go to Warren Buffett's website, their stock measurements and stock indices and analyses are telling us that they believe that the stock market is currently overvalued by almost 60%. In other words, if we had been looking at normal growth since 2020 to today in 2024, we should be 60% lower than we're at right now. But that's not what happened. And yet, for some reason... With this idea that folks in the stock market are just doing so well overall, then how come the median income of the average American is dropping? That's weird. So are all of them just flush with cash in their retirement accounts and just doing completely well? Well, retirement accounts have gone up a bit, but the median retirement account balance at retirement still today is less than $200,000. It's between 170 to 190 now. And when someone is basically relying on that plus social security, you can put together the math and that's when you see that the average American that retires right now living around 15, 20 years in retirement is going to be retiring on around $2,500 a month total, $30,000 a year, or comparable to full-time employment at a $15 an hour job, which famously now is the minimum wage that a lot of people are advocating for, you know, fighting for $30,000 a year for the minimum wage. Now, I don't think the average American is planning to retire on the lifestyle of a $15 an hour job. I don't think that was the purpose of you working 40, 50 years, making, you know, however much more that you did, hopefully. And then even after all of that, because, well, let's say you made a whole lot more than 30,000 a year. Let's say you made over $100,000 a year consistently just with your income. But you fell into the trap of buying a very expensive house, you fell into the trap of buying the house that you could afford, not the house that was going to be the best financial fit for you, that was still in a good neighborhood with good schools for your kids. You just said, hey, they qualified me for this maximum amount, so I basically went and got that house. You got trapped with some luxury car brands that are not reliable. I mean, don't get me started on car brand choices because there are some great car brands out there that are super reliable. I drive Toyota. I want to get a Lexus in the future because those are literally the top two most reliable car brands out there. And you can look at that with the recent study from Consumer Reports that showed you from 2023 who are the top five. Number one, Lexus, Toyota, then Mini Cooper, surprisingly, then unsurprisingly, Acura and Honda. So four out of the top five are Japanese 
their Toyota and the luxury brand for Toyota, Honda and the luxury brand for Honda. But a lot of people will get caught up in saying, oh, I want a luxury brand, won't name names. And they end up spending thousands of dollars just on maintenance more than they would if they had gotten a more reliable vehicle. So they fell into that trap. They fell into the keeping up with the Joneses trap in general of like, oh, hey, my neighbor went on this vacation. We better go over there. We better go to the school. We better do private school now, even though public schools in Texas are great. I mean, it just doesn't seem to end with some folks. And something that I was actually talking about my wife with um, on Sunday was just, it's so crazy to think that someone who could be making way more than $100,000 a year, well, if they spend so much and they're still ending up, you know, only saving a couple hundred dollars a month, well, how are they really in a different position than someone who's making way less and, and they're still saving a couple hundred dollars a month? Because the question here is, what are you going to be doing with your savings that's going to allow you to make a rate of return that, one, beats inflation, and two, allows you to retire with an actual high quality of life? And I would say with a quality of life that, at minimum, equals the life that you lived working. In other words, why would you want to live on a significantly lowered income in retirement, which are supposed to be your golden years. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me, and yet apparently it does make enough sense for the vast majority of Americans to do it. And I mean, it's just weird to just say, oh yeah, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make any sense, it's just completely foolish, it's idiotic, this on and so forth. Okay, but for some reason, that doesn't really motivate people to take action when they're putting it that way because I think that's an assessment that's more of an tr- ex- external focus. In other words, you can feel dumb about it, but really the, that thing of being you know, considered dumb is something that's more external. You, know, you don't want to look dumb in front of other people, but because it's external and it's more ego-based, it's not really something that actually motivates you. So we have to focus instead on what life are you actually looking to have in retirement? What level of income do you need to maintain the life that you have right now? And as a result, what amount of investment are you going to need to make at what rate of return to maintain that particular life that you have, that quality of life that you're enjoying now? I mean... For me, I would definitely be looking at it as, hey, I want to stay in the house that I raised my kids in. Like, once I have that forever home, that's a forever home. I'm not going to be downsizing, quote unquote, or reducing my house quality once I'm in retirement. And then it's like, again, well, Trevor, what if that's just going to save you a bunch on bills? Well, sure, but... This is, again, me not wanting to reduce the quality of my life in retirement. What specifically are you going to have to invest? What specifically are you going to have to save each month at what rate of return in order to maintain the quality of life that you have during your hardworking years? So when you finally retire, you're not shooting yourself in the foot and you can still enjoy the same quality of life as you did without working 40, 50 hours a week. So, folks, we're going to be right back after the final break. I'm your host, Trevor Davis at Total Wealth Academy. Y'all stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's an old joke. When is the best time to buy real estate? 20 years ago. When is the second best time? Today. And this is truer than ever with the impending recession and the correction that's going on right now. Real estate investors are going to make millions of dollars in the next few years because of the recession. You should take advantage of it as well. To find out how, please attend our free sample class to learn more. Go to TotalWealthAcademy.com. TotalWealthAcademy.com. Just click on the free sample class button. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to the final segment of the TWA Wednesday radio show. I'm your host, Trevor Davis. 
Final invitation to the expo. This is your opportunity to get this done. It's totalwealthacademy.com forward slash expo. Of course, if you're driving, please do not pull out your phone and be that person that texts and drives or gets on their phone and drives. Please wait, stop, and then get your reservation done. And if you're a member, go into the membership portal, sign in, go to the calendar, select the event. Both options allow you to pick your food from Teriyaki Madness on Saturday. And in case you don't want a teriyaki bowl, we will have some tacos as well. But tacos will be limited. You need to pick which one of those options that you need. Please let us know if you explicitly don't want that and want tacos. So we just touched base on how in the U.S. economy, despite consistent growth for the overall economy, with everybody included, most Americans... And by that, I mean the average American, the median income American family household, if you will, is seeing their income drop by over $4,000 over the last four years. And every single time that has happened, there has been a recession that has followed, a full-blown recession, not like the COVID mini recession, and nothing like a rapid expansion to the highest stock gains right after such a mini recession. In other words, 2008, as you will no doubt recall, was not something that lasted for a month. I mean, there's a reason they call it 2008-9, because that was like practically a two-year solid period. That was a very challenging economic situation. But it doesn't seem like we've gotten enough of this hard, hard truth that... The ups and downs of this cycle are the way that the system is designed to work. And I think the instant knee-jerk reaction to that is like, well, obviously we can't be growing forever. Or is that the goal is to grow forever? And then if so, you know, at what point do we actually find some sort of stasis and stability Like, are we just going to grow population forever? Well, apparently not, because population growth is significantly slowing down. And then, and it just seems like with the ups and downs, because after it stops, and then it's not, they the projections say it's not going to stabilize. It's that the projections from the UN and the universities that I've looked at are all saying that after we hit like 10 billion sometime by um, 20, the year 2100, so the end of the century, then it's going to start to go down. And then it's just like, okay, then it's going to start to go down until what? I mean, not zero, I hope. And then at what point is it going to go back up? It's like, why are all the things that we do just in these waves? Like, where, what is the end goal? Like, where is the stability with stuff like this? Where, where is the stasis, the sustainability with something like this? Because I don't think that it's particularly great that we're going to have these incredibly radical up markets and then these incredibly radical down markets where there are big winners, massive losers. We're dealing with people that have retirement accounts that lose 33% of their value or half of their value. And then they're trying to retire and they're just like, well, I honey, I guess we're just going to have to really scrimp and save in retirement now. We've, you know, we had a million in there and then now we're down to 500,000. So we can, you know, hope it goes back up, which, you know, eventually it typically does with the ups and downs. But that's a very unpleasant thing to take a look at for sure. When someone sees their retirement plan just get halved overnight or within the course of a couple days. And that stressor and that potential is one of the reasons why an asset like real estate is inherently more appealing to a lot of folks that know about it, have heard about it, or are getting educated about it. And that's why it's the focus of what we teach here. Because the ups and downs of the stock market can be radical overnight. It's a very different story even in the down markets for real estate because it takes a lot of time 
by comparison for a market to adjust with real estate prices going down. So for better or for worse, they are going to go down, not if, but when this recession starts to formally hit. And then we're going to start to see those price pressures start to ease off. And then we are going to start to see some discounts on properties. It's going to become more of a buyer's market rather than a seller's market. And I think we're going to have to, we're going to start seeing the effects of this recent ruling that basically guarantees that buyers also are on the hook for paying commissions. So that kind of puts the ball in both courts. And I think that's kind of a, a, stabilizing decision. In other words, that doesn't really make it more of a seller's market or a buyer's market. It It's a balancing force when both sides of the table and the transaction are going to be responsible for the commission. So one of those effects, I think, is going to be it's going to start to help offers be more reasonable. Because when a buyer now knows that they're on the hook for the commission, they're not going to be jumping for joy when they have to put down $30,000 over asking price and act like it's not really a big deal because they're going to get financed anyway. Well, now they're going to be on the hook for 3% of that $30,000 extra for paying their buyer's agent. So they've got a heavy incentive there to not just throw out crazy overpriced offers left and right without a care in the world. That's... From my understanding and from the realtors I've gotten to talk to, that seems to be kind of the idea of what's going to start affecting the real estate market um, starting now, actually starting from effectively a month and a half ago once that ruling was officially carried out. So that's a big change. Besides the income dropping, the other one I just saw, which I think is really equally as concerning and this was sent to me by one of the syndicators up here at Total Wealth that takes on passive investors for apartment deals. When we're talking about the housing issues in this country, well, this really wraps it up in the most concise way, in my opinion. Ten years ago, 46% of households in the country could afford the median priced mortgage. So for the median house, the average house. Apparently today, that number and that percentage has dropped to 26%. So it's almost been halved over the last decade. Now, a quarter of households in the U.S. can afford the median priced home. So when the percentage of households that can afford the average home has been effectively cut in half... There's something going on here that's not adequately expressed by the fact that we're having GDP growth, folks. You need to be paying attention to what's really going on for yourself, but also for the actual average Americans, because this GDP growth is not actually paying out to the average American. I don't know how to mince words about that, but that's the reality. So we have to be more strategic than ever before. We have to be more responsible than ever before. We have to be more in touch with investments that are going to pay dividends than ever before. Because if we're still dealing with a 3% GDP growth, but household incomes are still dropping, well, we cannot be part of that statistic. And I think there's a lot of other discussion there for sure, and that's a whole huge can of worms. But what I want you to focus on there is that intrinsic motivation. In other words, with what's going on externally and what could be happening with your household, and specifically, what do you need to do in order to make a substantial change and a substantial difference for your financial position. Because we cannot accept that this is just what's going to be normal for us. And I hope that you will not accept that either. 
So folks, if you liked what you heard today and you are interested again in doing the expo this Saturday, head to totalwealthacademy.com forward slash expo. Or if you're a member, go into the member portal and sign up for the expo again. This is the final invite I will send for the expo on Saturday, folks. I will see you there. Y'all have a great rest of your week. I'm Trevor Davis, and I'll see you next Wednesday. You've been listening to the Total Wealth Academy radio show. Please remember that this show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be construed as legal, tax, or investing advice. Always get a professional opinion before making any investment decisions. To find out more about coaching and consulting at Total Wealth Academy, visit TotalWealthAcademy.com and attend one of our free sample classes on real estate investing. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.